Hello everyone, welcome to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth, I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium. Thanks for tuning in. And in this week's coverage of the night sky, we're taking a look at the dates of January 18th through January 24th. And in this episode, we're gonna talk all about the constellation Gemini, what to look out for, and some interesting celestial objects within that area. We'll give you a moon update, talk about where that will be a planet update, and we'll talk about the morning sky and what to look out for if you're up at that time. So let's get started. If you tune into last week's episode, I spent a great deal of time talking about the wonderful constellation Orion, which we can see here. This is set to our local time of about seven o'clock. So around seven or eight o'clock, rising in the east, you can see these wonderful wintertime constellations. So in that long episode, I dive pretty deep into the stars and celestial objects of Orion the Hunter, which is worth it for this time of the year. But there is a neighbor not far from Orion that you've probably noticed in our sky. And if you look a little bit north and below Orion, around this time, around seven or eight o'clock, looking towards the east, you may see these group of stars are not as bright as its neighbor Orion, but there are definitely some stars inside of it that are pretty bright. And this constellation is very well known because this is what we call Gemini, the twins. And as you probably also know, this constellation is one of the signs of the zodiac since Gemini lies on the ecliptic line, the apparent path the sun seems to make in the sky. As we go around the sun, the sun looks like it's moving through the stars. So at certain times of the year, the sun does move through what we now call Gemini. And when I'm looking for this constellation at this time of the year, I know to usually look for Orion and near his head, you can find the twins, but also what helps is if you look above one of Orion's hunting dogs, if you look down below a little bit more to the east here at this time, you'll find these two stars. One star is much brighter than another. This star is called Procyon. So this is the small dog known as Canis Minor, very simple constellation. So just above that, are the stars of Gemini. And within the constellation, you'll notice two very bright stars. You'll find them right here. This is Pollux and this is Castor. And so those represent the heads of the twins. Actually, Gemini is Latin for twins. And so if you can see some of the other stars of the constellations, it almost does look like two people kind of holding hands, like these stick figure shapes holding hands in the sky. These are their arms their legs, this is Pollux and his legs, Castor and his legs here. This is kind of a newer idea. This version of the constellation comes from a famous author known as H.A. Ray. You probably know him from the Curious George books, but he also wrote a very popular stargazing book called simply The Stars. And in it, he made popular this version of the constellation, which makes way more sense than the older version, which was basically just this sort of weird kind of rectangular shape that made up the constellation. This really kind of almost humanized the stars and made it look more like figures in the sky, which makes way more sense. To bring this to life, we can turn on the artwork for Gemini. And from Greek mythology, Castor and Pollux were actually half-brother twins, which may not make sense at first, but the way the story goes, or at least one of the stories, depending on who told it, was that this woman named Leda was married to the king of Sparta. His name was Tyndarius. And at some point they made love. But soon after, Leda was captivated by the god of all the gods, who was named Zeus, as you probably already know. And just sort of in a side story, Zeus had seen Leda from the heavens, thought she was the most beautiful creature, decided to turn himself into a swan, which became the constellation we know as Cygnus the Swan, which is in our summer sky. But anyway, he turned himself into a swan, flew down, and mesmerized Leda. She thought the swan was just so beautiful. And at some point, they made love. And after all of these episodes, she gave birth to these twins. And it turns out that Pollux became half divine and half mortal, while Castor was simply all mortal. So his father was Tyndarius, the mortal king, and Pollux's father was Zeus. That's how they became half-brothers. And Leda also had their sisters as well. One was named 
Clytemnestra, and the other, Helen, who became Helen of Troy. So all of these siblings were very well known in their own right. The twins became famous as sailors who joined Jason and the Argonauts to find the Golden Fleece, but they also became well known when Castor died. He was mortal, and his brother Pollux was so distraught by losing his brother that he begged Zeus to make his brother immortal as well. So what Zeus did was decide to put them both into the skies above so they could live forever together as these stars that you can always find at this time of the year, at least according to ancient storytellers. Now, scientifically, Gemini has some interesting places to explore. So let's dive into the brightest star in the constellation, which is named after the twin who is immortal, whose father was Zeus. So let's take a look at this star here, which is Pollux. We're going to zoom right into it just a little bit more. And Pollux is actually an orange star. So it's a star that's at the end of its life. It's burned through most of its hydrogen and now burning some heavier elements in its core and it's been bloating up. And so it's a decent amount bigger than our sun, about nine times larger, about two times as massive. And for a large star, one of the closer ones to us at about 33, maybe 34 light years away. And just like many stars we're looking at closely, it turns out Pollux has an exoplanet going around it. Back in 2006, a planet about two to three times the size of our own Jupiter uh, has been found orbiting Pollux in about 590 days. And this exoplanet is called Pollux B, or now is known as Thestius. Now moving on from Pollux, let's head over to the second brightest star in Gemini, the one named after the other twin who is mortal, whose father was the king of Sparta from Greek mythology. And we'll turn on the constellation lines too, just so we have a little better understanding of where we're looking. So the other twin's head, the star Castor, is also quite interesting. So we're gonna zoom into that star and just get a better look here. So when you look at Castor closely with your naked eyes, it just looks like one single star. But hundreds of years ago, with telescopes, it was discovered that two stars could be seen or distinguished. Now, multiple star systems are actually quite common. Turns out that most stars in our sky have a companion or more. Our sun is quite unique being alone and solitary. But if you have a binary system, uh, that would be two stars. A triple or trinary system would be three. That's the most common type we've discovered so far. Then quadruple star system would be four, and so on and so on. But with more modern technology and equipment, it was actually discovered that Castor has six stars within it. It's a sextuple star system, which is quite rare. You don't find these all the time, but can happen. And the way it works out, it's three binary pairs going around each other in interesting ways. To really wrap our brains around a system like Castor, this really nice graphic provided by NASA and JPL does a wonderful job explaining a six star system. So at the bottom, you'll notice that these stars, the individual component stars of Castor, are being compared along with our own sun, our yellow star that we find here. And so the stars you probably mostly see with your naked eyes are Castor A and B, these really hot, bit larger blue stars. And Castor A has its own companion, a red star here, a red dwarf. Castor B has a companion as well, another red dwarf. And then we have Castor C, which are two red stars orbiting each other. The only way we can distinguish that these are binaries is that we've seen them spectroscopically which means we actually can't visually see these stars individually, actually, but we notice that these stars' light fluctuate, and what happens is the light can either be stretched or squeezed, which tells us these stars are moving, and if they're moving, they must have a companion causing this movement, and so these are called spectroscopic binaries. So at the top, this area here does show us how the orbits work. So we start here with Castor A and its companion. Those are two stars going around each other that we find here. Then we have Castor B and its companion. They are going around each other, and that's located here. 
those two pairs are going around each other and have their own gravitational center. And while those two groups are doing their thing, at the same time, a little farther away, we have two smaller red stars in the Castor C system. They're going around each other and they have a common center and those two stars are going around in their own orbit around the Castor AB system like that at the same time. This may seem a little complicated, a little wild, but it does show us how a six star system can work and how it's possible with three binary pairs. And at about 51 light years away from us, the Castor system is not too far when it comes to a six star system. So it's a relative neighbor of ours and one that, as you can see, is quite interesting. There's so much more than meets the eye. As we move away from both Castor and Pollux at the heads of Gemini, let's take a look at some of the other stars that make up the constellation. They're not as bright, but they are noticeable. So if we look over at Pollux again, you'll notice at one of the feet stars of this side of the constellation is a relatively bright star here. This one is the third brightest in Gemini called Alhenna. It's a star that's more than 100 light years away and another multiple star system, this time a binary or a spectroscopic binary, as I mentioned before. And you can find that at the foot of Pollux. We make our way over to the fourth brightest star in Gemini, that's in Castor. And that is where we find Tejat right here. It's a double star system. So not necessarily two stars going around each other, but two stars you can see in a large telescope that look close from our point of view. So they may not actually be associated with one another. We make our way to the fifth brightest star in Gemini in the middle of Castor. The star is called Mebsuta. Mebsuta is a very large star, much, much bigger than our sun and much farther away than many of the stars we find in Gemini at over 840 light years distant. And then we make it to the sixth brightest star, also something I notice more towards the foot of Castor. We find this one called Propus. And Propus is a triple star system or trinary. So we have three stars that make up Propus that we see there. So these stars I do notice in Gemini, not as easy to find as Castor and Pollux that we find here, but they do kind of help make those two stick figure shapes we've been talking about. And lastly, one really interesting deep sky celestial object that you can find within Gemini it's thousands of light years away within Pollux. We're going to zoom right into it. And it's what's called a planetary nebula. And it's not actually a planet. It looked like that to astronomers long ago. They look like these faint, wispy, planet-like things. But they're actually the leftover remains of dying stars similar to our sun and what our sun will do in billions of years. So this planetary nebula is called NGC 2392. And what's really interesting, it was discovered by William Herschel back in 1787. William Herschel was an English astronomer, it's quite well known, and he was the one who discovered Uranus. And as a side note, which is quite interesting that we're talking about Gemini here, William Herschel, six years before he discovered this nebula, actually discovered Uranus inside the constellation Gemini. He actually found it within this area of the sky, the seventh planet from the sun. So Gemini has a connection to that planet. But anyway, William Herschel saw this. And more recently, actually now it seems like a while ago, but back in 1999 or about 21 years ago now, the Hubble Space Telescope gave us this image here, which is really great, of this nebula. And so this is a star that ran out of fuel in its core and started to expand. It expanded, 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 and its outer layers were not held on to the star's gravity anymore and just kind of kept drifting away. And that's what you see in the very outer layers of this. And you see these kind of weird lobe-shaped things sort of streaming away. Those are probably denser areas that are resisting the movement of objects and particles going past them. And in the center, we have what's forming in the very center, what's called a white dwarf. That is the leftover core of the star that's sort of being crunched on itself. And on the outer layers of that, you have kind of another sort of spherical kind of layer. Those stellar winds 
uh, and gases are moving very fast. And so they're going to be colliding with the outer layers and you create these really beautiful shapes that we find here. And again, this is thousands of light years away. So we're really seeing it as it happened thousands of years ago, but it's a beautiful part of Gemini that we have pictures of today. So as you can see, Gemini is a wonderful constellation that you can see near Orion. I always look out for it in the winter and even into the spring as well. So hopefully you can find it too as it's rising out of the east at this time of the year. Find those two heads of the twins and maybe some of the other stars within these brothers from Greek mythology. Moving away from Gemini, we can take a look at where the moon will be. And starting off at the beginning of the week here on the 18th, the moon will still be in a crescent phase that we find here. And as we move along through these next few days here, we'll find that on the 20th, the moon will be a first quarter phase when you'll see it's half full and very close to the planet Mars that is still really high up in the sky. So Mars is still a wonderful planet to take a look at. And as we move through the rest of the week here, we'll find the moon will move past first quarter and into its gibbous phases as you see it approaching Taurus the bull as we get to the weekend here on the 23rd and the 24th. And there you see it there inside the horns of Taurus the bull that we see here uh, in this part of the sky. If you look towards the west as the sun is setting this week, you'll have a better and better view of the smallest planet in our solar system right near the setting sun, and that is Mercury. By the weekend, Mercury will reach its highest point above the sun. It's called greatest elongation east, and that's when Mercury is most east of the sun and highest in the evening sky. So by the 23rd and 24th, that is when that occurs, and you may have a chance, very low in the west, to see Mercury. It's not as bright as some of the other planets we've been talking about, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, especially not Venus. Um, but you do have a chance to see that planet. We don't always get much time. So this is the time to focus in on the small little world that moves so very quickly around the sun. We'll conclude with the early morning sky for those early morning stargazers that are out there. And this is the last week you have a chance to see the planet Venus shining in the morning before it dives into the sun's glare and then moves into the evening sky. So Venus being the brightest planet you can see is still technically visible just above the east and southeastern horizon before sunrise. You can find it there. So you will have to look at it through some of the sun's glare. And then not far away, you can actually see some summertime stars and constellations. You'll notice here, this is the star Antares, which is the heart of Scorpius, the scorpion. You'll find actually Venus is sitting in Sagittarius that we find there. Bright stars to look out for, Vega, part of Lyra the Harp, we can find. And also straight up in the sky, right as the sun is rising, we can see one of the brightest stars you can see in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's Arcturus, which is part of Bootes the Herdsman. So the morning has some very nice things to see, and especially with Venus starting to dive into the sun's glare, this is your last time to find it in the morning before it shifts into another time. Hey, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight. Thanks for tuning in digitally with us. And if you feel safe to do so and are in the area, please stop on by our Lowell and Nancy Lohman Family Planetarium. We're doing shows every day and you can check out our schedule online and on our website. And hope to see you back here again. Take care and happy stargazing.